Um, I will say there are no new cases at the Site C work camp in the Northern Health Region. There continues to be the one case uh, related to that. And we now have over 60 cases related to the multiple exposures in and around Kelowna over the last few weeks. So also today, we're going to be talking a little bit more about uh, the epidemiology that we've had here in British Columbia, as well as um, some preliminary information on the, the survey that people responded to. So to start with, um, we are going to give you an update on how and where the virus has affected people in British Columbia. So this is a weekly profile um, to the end of last week where we were up to 3,028 total cases. There were 72 new cases. As we can see, the median age still is around, so that's the most common age, the median age is still around 50, and about a little over half were, were women. Um, we have not yet seen that sort of change that we've seen in other parts of the country of younger people being more affected. Having said that, we know that many uh, and most of the, the cases that have arisen over the last weekend and the last uh, few days have been in, in people in their 20s and 30s. So I expect that number will change in the, next, in the coming weeks. We had uh, two new people hospitalized last week, again, um, a very small percentage in hospital currently. And as of uh, July 9th, when this data was um, prepared, we had 186 people who had died. Again, the median age of people who have died from COVID-19 is uh, quite elderly at 85. This is uh, the latest epidemic curve, so that is the number of the cases by uh, date of onset of illness. And as you know, we've been uh, reporting the by lab diagnosed and the epidemiologically linked cases. As we can see, we've been grumbling along over the last few months here in British Columbia. We managed to flatten that curve, but it continues to grow. It continues um, to have sporadic transmission events in the community. And most concerning, in the last week and a half, we have seen a growth in our number of cases, particularly in young people. Uh, this is the epidemic curve by likely source of infection. And what you can tell from this is that we do know where most people have been linked to uh, in terms of where they probably got their infection. And that is the work of the case and contact management, the contact tracing that we're doing across the province right now. And what we can see as well is there continues to be introductions from international travel. And that is uh, sometimes essential workers coming back and forth from the United States. It is our temporary foreign workers in some cases, as well as people, Canadians, who have repatriated from other countries, including more recently India. Um, the, the other important thing to note in this is that we are starting to, to see um, people who are testing positive in the last few days having a large number of contacts again. Early on, before we put in place our public health measures, we had, re we had people, um, every case had on average 11 or 12 contacts. Now we're starting to see that coming back, which means we're having increased connections with people in the community. We knew that would happen as we moved into this phase of our restart here in BC. But the challenge now is that we are no longer having a safe connections. And that is what is spreading this virus. So we are having clusters in certain environments where people are transmitting this. And these are mostly now we're seeing parties, um, small groups, people going together to restaurants and bars and clubs, but also in uh, houseboats, in resorts, at private homes. And the challenge with that is we may not know the people that we're in those close contact with. It's often outdoors or a combination of indoors and outdoors, but spending that time together with people and then mixing. So it might be a small group one night and then a different small group the next night. And those are the situations where we can pass this virus on. And it's very challenging for our teams in public health to find all the contacts in a timely way. So that is something we need to pay attention to, and I'll come back to that. Um, today as well, I wanted to present some of the data around people who unfortunately have severe illness and die from COVID-19. 
this is a, a challenging information because it's not at a population basis, um, but it is what we call case fatality. So those people who have tested positive or who have had the disease that we know about um, and the different settings where people have been exposed. So overall, and if this data goes back to July 9th when we had 183 people who had died, um, out of the 2,978 cases that we had reported at that time. So that gives a case fatality rate of about 6%. But if we break that down, we know that in some situations it's much more dangerous and much more lethal. So non-outbreak cases, so those are people who are infected in the community either through travel or through um, um, individual connections. We've had 50 people in that category who've died. But our, so the case fatality rate is about 2.6%, still much higher than we see with influenza, for example, but much lower than certain scenarios. When we look at our outbreaks, and so we've had outbreaks that have occurred in healthcare settings, both long-term care, assisted living, but also in acute care. So that is um, hospitals where we've had outbreaks on specific units. We had um, hospitals where we've had outbreaks in the ICU, on certain wards of certain hospitals. Um, and so if we look at those situations, our case fatality rate in long-term care assisted living has, is very high. So we know that about one in five people who are infected in those situations will die from COVID-19. This is one of the reasons why we have put so much time and energy at trying to protect our long-term care homes and our elders and seniors in those situations. The same can be said of outbreaks in acute care, although the numbers thankfully are smaller. Again, it's a very highly lethal situation because we know that people in hospitals, particularly in ICU, are people who have other underlying illnesses that put them at risk of having severe disease if they catch COVID as well. And finally, we've had other outbreaks. Um, so these would be community outbreaks like uh, the, the conference, a large conference early on, um, where we had a person who was infected at that conference and, and died, as well as things like our temporary farm worker outbreaks that we've had. And in those situations, again, much less risky in terms of having severe illness or dying, where the case fatality rate is less than half of 1%. I also want to bring us up to date on our modeling so that we know where we are in terms of keeping our curve flat and where we need to be moving forward. So this is uh, the update of the dynamic compartmental modeling that we have shown a number of times. What we can see from this though is that we're starting to see an upward bend of our curve. This is where we have wanted to make sure we continue to keep our curve flat, that we keep our contacts safe even as we increase the numbers. Um, what this shows is that we do have a possibility of having explosive growth in our, con in our, uh, in our outbreak here in BC if we're not careful in how we progress over the summer. I will say as well though, as we said last time, we are thankfully still having small numbers of cases per day. So this is what we call unstable, which means that the confidence intervals, um, that, that sort of pink uh, broad area is quite wide. What that says is we still have it in our hands to make a difference on bending this curve. When we look at things called our reproductive number, so how many people we transmit this virus to if we're infected, and we can see again, it has risen above one. That is concerning because that's a level at, at one is where we, we, trans, we can stop the outbreak. So we are at a place where we could see rapidly progression of transmission of this virus if we're not careful. This is again the, the modeling that with the scenarios that we have shown in the past. And what it talks to is what we could see if we make those changes that we need to think about now. We are probably at the rate of 65 or 75 percent of normal pre COVID contacts. 
and we run the risk of having a rapid rebound in new cases. We are starting to see an uptick. This is concerning. This is concerning, but it is not foregone that we will have a rapid rebound. It is something that we can make a difference in if we pay attention now. This is a, a, a slide that shows the Ciro survey that we presented on Friday. And it, what it tells you is that few than one in a hundred of us were infected with COVID-19 over the past few months up until May. This is good news. This tells us that the things that we did made a difference and prevented people from getting sick. And we need to pay attention to that in our interactions now as we continue on our restarting of our economy and our community here in BC. And now I want to move on to uh, the survey that we uh, presented or that we completed a number of weeks ago. It's called the Population Health Survey, Your Story, Our Future. And this is just an overarching snapshot. This is a large database. Many people participated. And I'm going to give you a, a, a sampling of the types of uh, how that, um, how representative the sample was of the population here in BC, and a couple of the high level things that we've looked at so far. There is much, much more to, to get out of this survey that is going to help us in understanding what we need to do to continue to progress through this pandemic in British Columbia. Essentially, one in ten adult British Columbians completed the survey, and there was over 394,000 people who completed the survey. Um, this included people from all areas of British Columbia, um, slightly underrepresented from the north, but there's things that we can do statistically to help make that a representative understanding of the responses. This is uh, some data now that tells us the difference between the people who responded to the survey and our population in British Columbia. So it tells us, you know, is the people that responded similar or different to our population? And then it gives you an idea of what we can do statistically to weight it so it is representative. And with the numbers that we've had, this large database, this allows us to be able to compensate for areas that we may not have had as many people um, respond. So as we can see, about 70% uh, of people who responded were female. And our population is actually a little bit more evenly balanced. But we can weight our sample to be able to understand um, how that impacts the people's responses. We are pretty well balanced compared to the, the BC population in terms of age of people who responded. And we were a little off in some areas around um, race and ethnicity, whether somebody was a visible minority or not. And so we can compensate for that to ensure that we hear the voices of people from different ethnic and racial groups. As well, uh, we uh, have looked at um, indicators like income and education, as this helps us understand what we call socioeconomic status and how that affects people's experience both with COVID, but particularly with the experience of the uh, measures that were put in place to stop the transmission of the virus. So to give you a, a few um, basic ideas of what we've looked at, four and five of people in British Columbia approved of the response that we had in public health here in BC. However, for younger people, this was less. Fewer younger adults felt that public health response was appropriate. And we're talking about younger adults um, being more differentially affected, and some of that comes out in the further data that we'll look at. When we look at whether people were following public health advice, I think it's reflected in the low numbers that we've had overall in our Ciro survey that most people we're taking the advice that we asked you to do and that we told you why we needed it to happen. So things like washing your hands, staying away from others when you're sick, avoiding gatherings, staying home when you're sick. And we did ask the question about, you know, can you, do you have the means to stay home if you're sick? This speaks to things like having sick leave at work or having a culture at your work that allows you to stay away when you're ill. And we can see that two thirds of people did but a certain, uh, an important 
group of people did not. And we need to address what we can do to make sure that that important measure is something everybody can take as we're moving through the next few months of this pandemic. The next slide looks at where the, the biggest challenges were being created here from the response to the pandemic and from the pandemic itself. So we can see that a, a significant proportion of people in British Columbia felt that their mental health was worsening because of the pandemic, whether that was anxiety, concern about the virus, fear about losing their job, fear about um, being able to care for their families. And about a third of people in BC reported having difficulty accessing health care, and that could be health care across the spectrum. About 15% of people were worried about being able to put food on the table for themselves and their family. And about 5% were concerned that they would likely have to move because they couldn't afford to stay where they were staying. Some of these things are reflected, of course, in the things that we are seeing in our communities, where there, the number of people who report being homeless or underhoused has increased. Um, about 15% of people who responded were not working directly because of COVID-19. And we know that's reflected in the unemployment statistics. As well, 69% um, of people felt that there's some impairment to their work, challenges in their work related to COVID or to the measures that were implemented to try and deal with the pandemic. Two thirds of people as well were very concerned about family members and their health and the, the fact that they might be vulnerable to having severe illness from COVID-19. And a third of people um, reported increased difficulty re, uh, meeting their financial needs for themselves and their family. So that is just a small sampling, but we also looked at, you know, who were the people that were more differentially affected? And what we're seeing is that young people bore a greater proportion of the, the mental health and economic burden than older adults. And this may in part be because the pandemic has impacted many of the occupations that they work in. So people who were age 18 to 29 and not working during to, because of COVID-19, one in 50% uh, of them, half of them worked in arts and entertainment, half of people worked in accommodation and food services, and one in three were in the retail areas. And we know that those are the areas that have been dramatically impacted by closures um, during the response to the pandemic. And this speaks to us as well around how important it is in our restart program to support these areas of uh, these sectors of our economy and of our communities. Younger people were more likely to report decreased mental health, decreased difficult or increased difficulty accessing counseling, not working, um, difficulty meeting their financial needs, and likely to have to move because of affordability. One in four young people reported a health condition associated with risk for severe COVID illness as well. The other group that we've looked at um, quite quickly, uh, initially in this, it was uh, families with children. Um, and they as well report a greater mental health and economic burden than other adults without children. So worsening mental health, uh, stress, sleep reduction, increased alcohol consumption, and concerns about um, financial situations in particular. So what does this mean for us? It is just a start. We are going to be looking at many other questions. And as I said, we have a plan for answering those questions that we need to help us put in place the right measures to support our communities and different parts of our communities as we move forward in this. And that will include looking at race-based data. That will be include looking at um, data uh, according to socioeconomic status, as well as what we have seen so far. And some of the other things that we've been looking at are, are people differentially affected in different parts of the province? And really, they're, they're, it is consistent across most areas of the province in how we are responding and what the impacts have been um, in different parts of BC. So we have flattened our COVID-19 curve so far, but our success has come with significant challenges and more for certain parts of our population than others.
This survey and the analysis that we will continue to get out of this survey will help guide us as we work together on approaches that balance our need to control this virus because we know that that is a part of how we can keep things going with the need to work, to learn, and connect with our loved ones and the importance that that also has in keeping us healthy as a community. So there's a few important things for us to take away from today's snapshot, the early snapshot. Many British Columbians have experienced worsening mental health as a result of this pandemic. I think this is a surprise to no one. Many have also experienced additional economic burden, and young people have experienced greater impacts than many others in the population. I've also been very heartened by uh, the resiliency that we have seen through some of the survey results, and we're still in the process of analyzing, analyzing them, but particularly older people. Our elders and seniors have a sense of resiliency that makes me heartened for how we can support each other getting through this. The epidemiologic data also shows that we are at a turning point. We have, uh, we right now show some concerning upward bending of our curve, upward trends in our infection rate, our reproduction rate. And that tells us we're on the edge. We're on an edge that might go up, but is in our hands to control. If we increase our social interactions too much without doing it safely, we do risk a rebound that will impact us all. You know, the, we must acknowledge that the number of new cases reported over the last three days is concerning. We have not had uh, 100 cases um, reported in a single time period. We have been very effective public health teams in containing the spread, but we all need to do our part, and this is a warning to us. We need to be the voice of care with our family and our friends to remind everybody that we can increase our contacts, we can continue to increase our economic, our travel, but we need to do it safely. And we know how to do that. We have done that in BC and we can go back to doing that. As I said on Friday, I'm not typically very active on social media, but I am asking you again, particularly young people, because we know you have been impacted by this. Be my voice on social media. Use your influence to share a message with your friends and your connections. Don't let COVID-19 spoil our summer. We can play safe and stay safe. And we know what we have to do to do that. There are a few things we all need to do to push that curve back down again. They go back to the things we've been talking about. Fewer faces, bigger spaces, using our layers of protection. Keep your groups small. Only spend time with those you know. Focus on your friends. Focus on your family. The more people you see, the more likely it is that someone will have COVID-19 and spread it to you and the people that you're close to. If you're going out, be considerate of the people who are working in those places, in the restaurants, in the pubs that you are visiting, in the resorts where you are staying. Be, uh, understand that the people who work there are at higher risk because they are looking after many other people. So be kind and show gratitude as they follow the WorkSafe BC requirements for safe operations. We have COVID plans, COVID safety plans for a reason, and we all need to follow those rules to keep each other safe. Don't ask your server to bend the rules. Rather, help them by bending our curve. Ensure your groups are no longer no larger than six people in your, if in a restaurant or a club. No table hopping. And always, always, always stay away, stay home if you're not feeling well. If you're hosting a small gathering, small gathering, remember to keep those gatherings small, know people who are coming and stay outside as much as possible. And also, we need you to have a designated contact keeper so that we can assist you and find people if you inadvertently are exposed. We need to do that now so that we can continue on our restart program, we can continue to enjoy our summer, and we can continue to recover from the effects that we have had over the last few months. Help us spread the message to socialize safely, 
so we can keep COVID-19 low and slow. And let's, of course, continue to be kind, to be calm, and to be safe.